Hi, everyone. Welcome to Global Day of Jewish Learning. My name is Sarah Chandler, and I'm honored and excited to be teaching and learning with all of you. Our guest here is Rabbi David Seidenberg, who I will introduce in just a moment. First, I'm going to say a little bit about this organization, Jewish Initiative for Animals. We were founded in this past year. We launched in January 2016. And I am the Chief Compassion Officer, the CCO, where I work to support Jewish institutions to establish meaningful food policies rooted in Jewish ethics and animal welfare. And we have a whole bunch of different projects happening. And one of my personal favorite projects is teaching individuals and communities, schools, camps, Hillels, Moisha houses, synagogues, all kinds of people in all kinds of places, all about animal welfare as a Jewish value. And so today we're going to get to have a really interesting, really exciting conversation with one of my absolute favorite teachers on this topic of eco theology and compassion for am animals. And I'd like to introduce. My dear friend, Rabbi David Seidenberg, I've been learning from him for 13 years now. Actually, actually, maybe 14 years now, I first heard him speak at the JCC in Manhattan and have been inspired by him ever since. He actually just came out with a book. He's going to hold it up for you. Kabbalah and Ecology, God's Image in the More Than Human World. And it's actually coming out in paperback this December. Want to hold that up for us, David? Rabbi Seidenberg was ordained both by the Jewish Theological Seminary and Reb Zalman Shakhtar Shalomi. He lives in Northampton, Massachusetts, where he runs the Prayground Minion. And he's also the author of The Prayer for Voting, downloaded from his website, which I hope you'll all check out, neohasid.org, N-E-O-H-A-S-I-D.org. It's a really fabulous website. It has a bunch of great resources about spirituality, music, eco-theology, great place to find the perfect nigun or tune for your next time you're leading services or want to gather folks and singing. I know I use it regularly to download some modern liturgy that I need for my community. Anything you want to add by way of introduction before we jump in, David? Sure. Thank you, Sarah. First of all, it's, um, it's really exciting to be doing this with Jiffa. And Jiffa has been doing great amazing groundbreaking work for the whole community. So I appreciate it and a lot of people appreciate it. And I wanted to just say about my work, uh, I do eco-theology, spirituality, nigunim, dance, and the question you might ask is, how does this all to get tied together? And what I wanna say or add is that um, it's all about embodiment. How are we in the world in our bodies? Not the problem, but the joy, the pleasure, the sweetness of embodiment. And how do we make that penetrate um, all of our actions and our rituals and our spirituality. Great, thank you so much. So we're gonna get started. I wanna make sure everyone knows that we have a really fantastic source sheet. And if you go to the Global Day page, which I'm imagining most of you are watching this either live or in the future on the Global Day page, uh, the title is Compassion into Action from Animal Care to Justice for All Living Beings. And then there's a link, it says download the source sheet. So you're gonna to wanna to download that source sheet. Some of the text we'll be studying together, we will show on screen, but ideally you'll download this source sheet. All of our texts are available both in Hebrew and English translation. And again, thank you for David. Most of these are uh, original translations by Rabbi David and uh, it's a really, really robust set of information. So, you're gonna download that, that packet. And if you have the packet, um, it's gonna look like this. So uh, I'm gonna share my screen here so you can see uh, just what the top page of the packet looks like and make sure everyone has it. Screen share. Here we go. All right, so the packet looks like this. It says Jewish Initiative for Animals, and you can download it right to your computer screen, follow along with us. All right, so 
David's going to David's going to get us started our first unit which starts with the letter A we're going to be talking about eating and the role of eating and human animal relationships in the Torah. So David, why don't you give us some grounding about the the origins of humans and eating plants and eating animals and what the animals eat. Okay. So um, the first set of texts we have here has to do with what is the Torah's vision of our relationship to the world. And what is important, obvious perhaps, if you think about the story of the Garden of Eden, is that the first and only mitzvah the Torah begins with is a, is a mitzvah about what to eat. And this is not just about what to eat in the sense of food, but how to be in relationship to the earth and to the world and to the creatures around us. There is a fundamental problem that every religion needs to deal with, which is um, something that is hard to pay attention to if you're imbued with a modern perspective on things, which is that the world around us is filled with spirit, it's filled with life, and yet we need to take, destroy, or kill life in some ways in order to survive and have our own lives. So how do we balance these things so that our relationship with the world is whole and, in, and is life-giving, not just for ourselves, but for the world around us? So the Torah begins by telling us, of course, that we can eat plants but not animals. That's the first text. See, I give you every seed-bearing plant that is upon all the earth and every tree that has seed-bearing fruit, etc. And then, of course, the commandment to not eat uh, from the tree of knowing good and evil. And people know the story, I'm guessing. So we did, we, the people in the story, ate from the tree of knowing good and evil. And uh, by the way, according to Kabbalah, the test wasn't to never eat from the tree of knowing, but it was to wait until we were ready. Both the fruit had to become ripe and we had to become ripe. So what does it mean to be ripe for knowledge? That is a, a question at the heart of all of these texts in a certain way. So after the flood, before the flood, God decides something's wrong with his creation entirely. God plans to wipe everything out. Uh, but Noah is asked to build an ark and to take the lives of the creatures onto the ark in order to save them. So before Noah, humans are given permission to eat plants, animals are given to, permission to eat plants, and it's um, one, in, one way of reading the text is to say that the humans and the animals are given permission to eat the same things. Yes. And so we have this in common. There's a kind of a shared world and uh, um, a comradeship almost. Like God That's is talking on. to both of us equally and treating us as equals. Mm -hmm. Yes. And it's not only that, of course, there's the other side, which is uh, God's permission or description of us as having a kind of dominion, whatever that means. And it's not clear what that means, but actually we're going to get into that question very quickly. So after the flood, we have the big change, which is God saying, you can eat animals, right? This is A2, bear fruit and multiply, fill the land. A terror of you and a dread of you will be over every wild animal in the land and over every bird of the sky, over every cr everything crawling on the ground, over the fish of the sea, and to your hand they're given. Every crawling thing which lives will be for you for eating, like the grass I give you at all. But the flesh with its nephesh, nephesh is usually translated as soul. It can mean life or self. The flesh with its blood you will not eat. It's nefesh, which is its blood. So, um, what's going on here? Why are we given permission to eat animals, and why is this very strong prohibition given about blood? And what does that mean for us? So that's a question I want you to have in mind in all of this entire session. What I want to propose to you as a, it's a kind of a thought of experiment, because we can't really interview our ancestors to find out what they were thinking. All we have is the witness of the Torah. But um, consider this idea, that for our ancestors, who had a very important, meaningful relationship with their animals, it was morally at least a kind of confusing thing, what does it mean to eat these animals that we take care of? It wasn't a simple, feeling that, oh, we own them so we can do what we want. That was not the case, right? And so uh, there is this idea of concentrating, you could imagine, concentrating the idea of the life of the animal 
in one part and saying that part is absolutely sacred. It can only be used for sacred purposes and we set it aside. And then by doing that, we take care on a spiritual level of what the animal is or what it represents as life. And then we eat what's left. So if you'll, if you'll look as we go through these texts, you'll see that that way of looking at things is pretty consistent with how the Torah describes and discusses animals in general. So our ancestors essentially said, all beings have souls, animals have souls, and we choose to protect and hold sacred the soul of the animal. And so we imagine that to be concentrated in the blood because soul and breath are closely connected. And of course, blood is the breath that is inside the body. So we, choose, we see the soul as concentrated in the blood or identified with the blood. And therefore we set that aside as the soul of the animal. Any points so, uh, or questions so far, Sarah? Well, I think just something to keep in mind is, you know, for those of us who don't eat animals in modern times or who, you know, there, there's a common thing of, oh, eating the animals is helping them. And, you know, what we know about modern times, let's, let's keep in mind the, the, the other side, this other side of this. And so that the, something that I, always really appreciate um, that you're able to frame is that in modern times when we talk about eating animals, we're talking about animal products, animal food products, food, food from animals. And in ancient times, that wasn't something that was as common. People had a relationship with the animals they were eating. So something I want to make sure you touch on is that how these commandments and how the relationship to the blood or the prohibition of the blood helps define what a human animal relationship used to be and maybe could be as we're renewing that in modern times. Yes, let's let's go to that almost directly. I just want to make one footnote here, which is all of the laws of kashrut, of how you slaughter the animal, um, are entirely related to the question of how do you make the, sure the blood comes out of the animal so that you don't run the risk of eating any of the blood. So there are, there are many things that have to do with uh, making sure the animal has the least amount of pain, all this kind of stuff, or no pain at all, if possible, uh, in its being slaughtered. But the actual way of slaughter is determined by how to make sure that the blood is removed or um, um, received, I should say. It's not removed like it's a bad thing. It's received as something sacred, separate from the animal. So how can we make sure that the blood is received? So with that, with that note, I want to go to section C first and focus on the next. I'll take it there right now. So these are a few texts about shepherding. And the point of these texts that, that I want to bring to you is that for our ancestors, their relationship with animals was not simply functional. Um, animals were not use, uh, simply uh, use objects for them. These were profound relationships, so profound that the co most common metaphor for our relationship with God is the relationship between the shepherd and the sheep. So here's just a few texts, starting with C1. Like a shepherd, the one pastures his flock. In his arm, he gathers lambs. He lifts them in his bosom, leading the ones who suckle. That's from Isaiah. And Psalms 23, one that... Uh, almost everyone knows, Adonai is my shepherd, I will lack nothing. He makes me crouch alongside rich fields of grass. He leads me beside calm, restful waters. Your staff and your signet, these comfort me. And C3, for the one is our God, Eloach, and we are the people shepherded by him and the flock of God's hand. And this theme that our covenant with God is represented by the relationship between shepherd and sheep is uh, continues in rabbinic in rabbinic lore, so in C4 you see, it says, when Moshe, our teacher, was tending the flocks of Yitro in the wilderness, right, a lamb scampered off, Moshe ran after it, right, the lamb reached the shelter, came upon a pool of water, stopped to drink, Moshe caught up and said, I didn't know that you ran away because you were thirsty, now you must be tired, so he put the lamb on his shoulders and walked back with it. The Holy One said, because you show such compassion in tending the flock of mortal beings, right, as you live, 
by your life, you will become the shepherd of Israel. Now, what it meant for Moshe to become shepherd of Israel was not, of course, that Moshe was eating people, right? Uh, and yet, the shepherds were eating their lambs, and they saw that as the metaphor for what it meant to have the most loving, caring relationship with a group of beings. Yeah. And so this is, um, this is a very strong uh, indication that their understanding of what animals were in their lives is so radically different than any civilization that could carry out something like factory farming, like the world we have today. So Sarah, um, let's now step back and go to A3, I think. Bereshit Rabbah. Bereshit Rabbah. And do we have any questions coming over the chat? Do we need to be um, thinking about that? If you're if you're on this and you and you want to send in a question, uh, we can take questions pretty much at any point. So please send them to us. Great. No qu no questions yet, but I okay. I like this thread of human animal relationship in ancient times and that being core, uh, which we're going to bring that back to in modern times. You know, for sure the consumer rarely has a relationship with the animal that they're eating. Um, but even the shokh team, even the people who are owning the slaughterhouse facilities, they're sourcing their animals from the same con factory farm conditions that the majority of animals in our country are sourcing them from. They don't even have a choice. They don't even have the relationship with the animals. So we'll come back to that. Good, good. So um, a fundamental question uh, that belongs in this conversation is what does it mean when the Torah says, or do we got tayam, et cetera, what does it mean to have dominion or to dominate? There's many ways to translate that term. Um, the fish and the birds and, the, and the, the domestic animals and the wild animals and the crawling animals, these are all the categories that are given in Genesis. So Bereshit Rabbah is the earliest Midrash written um, um, only uh, or chiefly about stories, as opposed to earlier midrashim are almost completely about Jewish law, that is interpreting Jewish uh, legal verses in the Torah uh, to explain what they mean and how they're practiced. Bereshit Rabbah is almost entirely focused on stories and storytelling. And I, I've heard uh, and, and thought about uh, um, a lot, people call midrash uh, ancient form of fan fiction, and that's a very good description of what we're talking about here. So in this particular, uh, text. We have A3. It's a comment on what we read in A2, which is, of course, after they come out of the ark, God says to Noah, right, a terror of you and a dread of you will be over every wild animal in the land. So why did it say terror of you and dread of you? So Bereshit Rabbah says, when Noah came out of the ark, Fear returned, um, Mora, fear and terror returned, but Ridia, which is the, the noun form for Urdu, right? Ridia, dominion did not return. So that somehow things shifted coming from out of the ark so that humans lost dominion. And this is an interesting thing because here we have the, the Midrash saying that dominion is the opposite of eating the animals. And that's a, a question to think about. What does it mean that the time when we're given permission to eat the animals, we at that moment no longer have dominion over the animals? So that's the claim of Bereshit Rabbah. And it's an interesting one. It tells us that our ancestors thought about dominion in a very different way than uh, a modern person might think of dominion. Uh, that is, dominion is not about the right to control and own and use and destroy at will, but something uh, quite different than that. So I want to look at the set, the next one, A4. So this is, says Rashi's commentary on Bereshit Rabbah. If you look at Midrash Rabbah in the, in the book as it's printed, you will find this listed as Rashi. It's actually by an Italian commentator whose name is not certain, but it's exactly the same time period as Rashi. So we don't need to worry about exactly who it is for the moment. But this Rashi, in quotes, says, uh, what it means to say they didn't have dominion is that before the flood, Adam would call the animals and they would simply come. That is, they were in this intimate relationship because they were in 
the human being's domain, reshut. So what it meant to have dominion or to have reshut, which is another kind of word for ownership, is not the ability to use, but the ability to call out, to reach out, and to be responded to. So Sarah, shall we go on from there? Do you want to make any points? Yeah, I mean, I think I, I just want to say, you know, one of our one of our key one of our key questions that we put out in imagining this session is what is our obligation to animals and what can the Torah tell us about that? So I think also in the I just want to say and also in terms of the environmental movement, it's a very confusing question to say, well, you should take care of the earth because you're the humans and you have all the power versus you should take care of the earth because we are the earth and we should be caring for the earth as part of the earth. And, you know, especially in this modern political climate, it's very clear, huh, just use the word climate. It's very clear that there's a lot of people who think that our power over the earth and the animals and over anyone that doesn't have a voice is rooted in actually this God-given power. And what I think we're starting to see is some examples of it's, it's not that cut and dry and that it's actually the responsibility is to put actually their needs before our needs. So I, that's, that's a little bit of a question and a statement. Yes. And it's a, it's a great thing to think about. So uh, the fundamental principle can, is either Creation is here to serve us. That's the modernist and sort of um, self-righteous human view, anthropocentric human view that many people think the Torah is holding. Or opposite is we're here to serve the world. We are special because we're here to serve the world. If you think about it, this also applies, and this is slightly a field, but not too much, to what it means to be the chosen people. That is, uh, there are midrashim, and I don't think mo any, uh, very many people believe this now, but there are some who say, that say that uh, what it means for us to be the chosen people is that ultimately all of humanity will be serving us in some way. But that's not what it means to be a nation of priests, which is what we're called to be. A priest is one who prays on behalf of other people, who acts and does rituals on behalf of others, not who others do for them. Mm, right? mm. In fact, it's the corrupt priests. Mm. That are that are talked about in multiple places in the Torah. They're the ones who think that their role is, or their their privileges, that they get to take from the people. But it's exactly the opposite. Their job is to bring blessing to the people, to pray for the people. And the same thing, what it means to be priests for the world, mishpachot adama, is that we are praying on behalf of the human beings, and and uh, in, in the bigger picture, we are praying on behalf of all creation and serving, because avodah means service, and that's the word for prayer, but it's also the word for labor that we do on behalf of a greater goal. Great, yeah. thank you, that's really, that's really clear and helpful. Um, we have a technical question that if you, wanna, if you wanna save for later, let me know, but it's a good question, because I know we wanna talk about this. What should we do, if the blood is sacred, what should we do with it? Is there, if we shouldn't just, you know, dump it out. So what should we be doing it with it? And a little bit, um, I'm gonna imagine that this is not just a curiosity question, but also a halachic question. Yes, so we actually will get to that in uh, in B in a moment. So let's just have that in mind. We will come to that yeah. soon. Great. So I wanna go to A5 though right now. A5. I'm gonna- I want to, I want to just, just uh, show out this thread of the soul of the animal continues over many years. So this is Rambam, Nachmanides, many centuries later. Because Noah rescued the animals to keep the species in existence, God gave them permission to slaughter and to eat because their existence was because of them. Okay, there's all kinds of questions and problems that that point raises, but let's take it for granted for the moment. The next part is what I wanna focus on for the moment, right? With all this, even with the idea that God put the animals in the hands of Noah, right? and Noah's family, God did not give permission for the soul. For the body of an animal that doesn't talk became permitted after death, not the soul itself. And this is the reason for shkita, for slaughter, meaning the rules of slaughter, and for what the sages said, which is that uh, suffering, the pro prohibition to cause suffering to animals comes from the Torah. This idea that somehow the animal having a soul, which we might uh, translate into the capacity to suffer and to feel. Mm. Mm determines uh, 
all these laws, which I was saying before, but you see that we have Ramban saying this also in a very different century in a very different time, long after the rabbi, the classical rabbis, but also long before us, saying the same kind of thing. And uh, I think I'm going to save Moshe Cordovero A6 for a little bit later. Let's go on to B. Great. Want to go on to B? Yeah. No, yeah. we have A. We want to go to the second part of A, eating animals, wild versus domesticated. Because this will get to the, the question that someone was asking. So we have a few laws here. Now we know, and it, and we didn't quote these verses, but this is in many places in the Torah. Blood uh, in this in the in the um, temple, all blood of any sacrifice goes to the altar. Depending on the sacrifice, sometimes the entire animal is also offered on the altar. Sometimes only particular parts of the animal. Uh, always the fat, which is in, which is called the omentum in in anatomy. Uh, goes also on the altar. The reason why is because it's it's um it's filled with a network of blood vessels, and so you can't actually separate the blood from it at all. So the fat that is called sacred fat, chelev, along with the blood, goes on the altar, and that's sacred. So that's what we do essentially, except the question that was asked is, uh, I think, what do we do now that we don't have a temple? What do we do now without uh, this outlet? So first of all, there are two different sets, there are two different laws for the blood, one for domestic animals and one for wild animals. So A7 is for wild animals. Any uh, person from Israel and from the stranger living in their midst who hunts prey, animal or bird, which may be eaten, they will spill the blood and cover it with earth, cover it with soil, right? For the nephesh of all flesh is its blood and all who eat from it will be cut off. So the first idea of what we do with blood here is that it gets buried. And in fact, there are uh, later Midrashim um, that talk about this, this mitzvah. So it's, it's uh, variously called Kisui Adam, covering the blood, but also uh, Kavod Adam, honoring the blood, honoring the blood. That through Kavod Adam, one is actually burying the animal, giving it a burial the way one would bury a human being when a human being dies, except one is burying the blood and then using the rest of the animal. So um, that's the, the sort of the maximal picture of what we might be talking about, the one that most clearly talks about the animal as having a soul comparable, not the same, but comparable to a human soul and therefore requiring a burial the way a human requires a burial. And uh, Der Hagav, uh, as a side note, there are halachot, Jewish laws about how you bury the blood, which require it to be done in a way that is honoring the blood. So specifically the example given is that you're not allowed to put the blood, put the dirt over the blood using your foot. You have to use your hand because that's honoring the dead, right? As we, as we have all these laws about honoring the dead for human beings. Now Deuteronomy A8 says something a little bit different. And this is specifically only talking about domestic animals. In this case, it says, if you can't bring your animal, the animal that you raise yourself to the temple, Wild animals are never sacrificed in the temple. If you can't bring the animal you've raised to the temple because it's too far, then you can eat it in your gates with all the desire of your soul. Only be strong, lest you eat the blood, for the blood is the soul. On the ground you will spill it like water, so that it will go well for you and for your children. So here for domestic animals, there isn't a requirement to give it a burial in that full sense of honoring the soul of the animal. And it's an important... Uh, question to think about why is this? Why the difference between domestic and wild animals? And I don't have a complete answer for this question, except to say that there's this idea, and this is reflected also in the Noah text we already read, the Noah Midrash, which is that somehow if you raise an animal, you've given it life, you can take life in the same way. Now, I don't think that's going to sit well with people who want to be vegan. And that's okay, I don't want to convince people to change their minds about that. But if we want to, and I'm also vegetarian, by the way, just to, to make the point. But if we're eating animals and we've given it life, we've nurtured these animals and raised them. Remember for our ancestors, this was a, a kind of a, a covenantal, a deep relationship, emotionally, spiritually, a deep relationship. Um, they, there is this idea, I think, that 
if you have responsibility for the life of the animal, then you also have responsibility to give it its death on some way, on some level. And if you think about it, not in terms of eating or not eating animals, but in terms of the, of the idea that all of us need to die, whatever creature we are, and that, in fact, one of the big problems with human beings is that we don't know when we're going to die, and we don't know how we're going to die, and it's scary to think about. To say, to look at an animal and say, I know, I can know when you're going to die, and I'm going to give you a death that's easy, as opposed to you living until you get sick, or living until you get torn up by a wolf or something like that. But I'm going to choose a time which is merciful, loving, and nurturing both the life of your generations and mm -hmm. the life of my generations, right? Our life process that is mutual and flowing from one to the other. To be able to do that is, um, is considered a, a kind of a spiritual calling almost. Being a shepherd was a kind of a spiritual calling for them. So I'm not saying that this is how I would, what's that, Sarah? Oh, I'm, I'm just, I wanna uh, mention a, a couple other questions, but maybe I'll let mm -hmm. you finish your point. Oh, great, okay. Uh, I'm not saying that, that this is exactly how, maybe we want to innovate more rituals than what is told in the Torah. But the Torah says you, you simply let the blood flow onto the ground. What tends to be the custom now is that a shochet will do the slaughter over straw or something that will absorb the blood and then take that straw and do something with it that is yeah. respectful. Yeah. Right. And, th and that can be done also with burial. So it's not a mitzvah to bury the blood of, the, of a domestic animal the way it is for a wild animal but it's still uh, something to be treated with respect. And in fact, there's no reason why you can't bury it. And so maybe we want to say, actually, we want to make sure that that level is given to the, to the domestic animals as well, because we want to emphasize this uh, covenantal relationship, which we've lost so much of in modern times. Great. Well, I can see that we're, we're getting close to moving to section B. And so I wanted to mention that we do have a question about keeping pets. So, keeping an animal that their purpose is actually not for food. They have another purpose. It could be to have a companion, it could be for your own entertainment. It could be for experiencing deep love and connection with another living thing. And I know uh, some of our texts in section B talk about having animals for the purposes of work. And so, uh, whatever you want to say on that when we get there there's a question what does it mean in terms of keeping pets we're responsible for their well-being and we keep them from suffering but we're not slaughtering them so uh, if this isn't the focus of this session but there's a halakhic question there no um, it fits in right here it's, it's okay, totally great. fine because in fact um, we do it's not a stretch at all for people to think they have a covenantal relationship with their dog or their cat yeah. in fact I think that's absolutely the norm for how people experience those relationships and in fact we find ourselves responsible for giving what we would call an easy death to our pets and in some ways it's the kind of easy death that that when i think about it i wish i could give to someone who's in in a painful painful illness the halacha doesn't allow for that and that's a completely separate question uh, which I don't want to go into except to say that I think it's an important thing we will need to be discussing in the future, meaning we the Jewish people. It, it's already been discussed, but we'll need to continue discussing it as um, we can push off death more and more and more. But, uh, so we choose to give what's called a mitayafa, an easy death, to our pets. When they're sick, then we choose the time. We choose the time when we can say goodbye, when we can uh, hold them, yeah? and give them whatever medication is given that that we call, we call it putting to sleep. I always hated that euphemism. Um, putting down sounds worse, actually. But putting to sleep, even though I don't like its euphemistic uh, quality, says something about what the intention is, which is to give a certain ease to the animal. Now, obviously, there are people who don't treat their pets with this kind of love and this kind of covenanting. Uh, so that's also something that, that we would want to fight against or prevent. Um, I'm going to make a quick comment, and then I want to just, David, double check if you want to do anything else in A, and then we'll go on to B. Yeah, I do want to do one in A. I'm go really ahead. appreciating the, the language about covenant, because I think some of the work we're doing in Jewish Initiative for Animals 
is in addition to promoting an increase in plant-based foods in mainstream Jewish settings, which is a, an important part, we're also working with farmers. We're working with farmers, small meat companies, large meat companies, distribution companies, and we're thinking about how we can not just each animal has more space or each animal has sufficient food, but actually put together auditing systems for the animals to have the access to medicine, access to shade and sun, access to clean air where they can develop their own immune system without needing antibiotics to catch up those things. And I love thinking about the idea of maybe I'm not going to raise my own animals for meat, but I can work on a nonprofit that puts auditors on farms and video cameras even to make sure that at every stage of those animals' life, they are healthy and safe and that and that we can actually call that a covenantal relationship with the animals that later become our food. Yes. Mm -hmm. So uh, A6, and ditto to everything that Sarah just said. This is Moshe Cordovero, so now we're, we've moved up a few centuries. We're talking in 16th century now. Again, you'll see there's a, there's a strong thread of responsibility to animals woven in here. A person should not uproot a growing thing except for need, nor kill any animal except for need. And one should choose a good death or an easy death, a mitayafa for them, with a carefully examined knife to show mercy however is possible. This is the principle, compassion should be over all existences, over all creatures, in other words, to not hurt them, unless it's to raise them from level to level, from growing to living, from living to speaking. For then it is permitted to uproot the growing thing and to kill the animal because the debt, outweigh, uh, the debt uh, will be outweighed by the merit. So uh, first of all, assumption here, that when we kill something, even a plant, we are incurring a debt. And we only have the right to do that as conscious, uh, moral beings if there's some benefit given not just to us but it has to be a benefit given to the animal or plant that we're using this is a significant shift from um, almost everyone before Moshe Cordovero so I want to emphasize that second thing Mita Yafa that language derives from the Talmud in two places which talks about how do you execute someone who has been found guilty of a, a crime that gets capital punishment. Now, that's not a pleasant thing to think about, and it's not something we, we, we um, practice now generally. Uh, the rabbis made the conditions for capital punishment so narrow as to make them almost never possible, uh, make, make it almost never possible for it to happen. But within that framework, they said, if there was a capital punishment, you need to do it. Uh, it needs to be a mita yafa, an easy death. And the derivation, and this is the thing that's so important, the derivation, uh, the verse from which this principle is derived is ahafta reyecha kamocha, you should love your neighbor as yourself. Right? And so even someone who is a condemned criminal, one still needs to love them, be responsible for them, see them as a friend or a neighbor, and give them what one would wish for oneself in the same circumstances. So Moshe Cordovero is quite radically saying ahafta reyecha kamocha applies to animals. And not just to people. Great. Actually, I'm going to I'm going to share this next question, and I think it's going to help us a lot moving into uh, the next uh, section. So we're already at uh, 40 minutes. We've already been doing this for 40 minutes, and we want to get a bunch more text in. So yes. we have this beautiful question that says, "It's such an interesting difference in terms of responsibility to the suffering soul. The easy death for animals is it ease to them, or is it ease to us?" And this is something I know you and I have talked about in terms of, are we doing this for the animals? Are we doing this for ourselves? And, or is there even something bigger that's making us make these choices or that made the ancients who are writing these consider the importance of easing the animal suffering? Let me, let me ask a question to the person who put that up so they can answer it. Sure. Are you maybe making it easy for us as a way of deluding ourselves into thinking that it's okay? Uh, or do you mean easy for us in a positive sense? Because I could see that question, uh, I could interpret that question in both ways. Because uh, I think it's certainly possible to interpret all of these rituals as ways of um, 
giving ourselves the illusion that everything's all fine and lovely when in fact maybe it isn't and that is a that is a, an essential problem with religion and ritual that is rituals are all designed at their root in their origins to teach how to live in a sustainable deep thoughtful way but what if you lose the thoughtfulness and then you just do the ritual um, this has happened not just with our religion and many other religions that were that, that are considered Western religions, but for example, um, and I hope I'm getting these facts well enough correct, the Comanche tribes, um, from what I read uh, in the plains, were said to have white plains, like mid, we're talking about like, um, I think, um, the Missouri River area, but I'm not sure. Um, because because they were being offered money for buffalo hides were wiping out the buffalo not collecting not taking from them in a sustainable way because they were influenced by this uh kind of mercantile system where they could sell and make more money by taking more animals and they were wiping out and did in fact wipe out uh many regions of herds of buffalo and they would do their rituals to bring to, to pray for the life of the buffalo but they were still killing them to sell the hides, as yeah. opposed to killing what they needed for themselves. And so the rituals don't work in that context, right? Yeah. That is, any ritual put into the wrong context can be distorted so that it is just an illusion to make us feel better, right. without actually accomplishing its purpose. Now, uh, did any did the person who asked the question answer well, about? What we're still meant? waiting for it. Um, I do have another comment um, mm -hmm. that made me think of. I often meet people who have a let's say romantic, I'm, that's not even my word, that's their word, a romantic idea of getting to eat the meat of an animal that they raised themselves or that they met before it was slaughtered. And that feels very important to them, you know, on a spiritual level, that feels very meaningful to them. It's outside the factory farm system. And some people go down the path of being even certified as a shokhet, as a kosher butcher ritual slaughterer because they so badly want that. And it's interesting when I speak publicly or I tell people about the work of Jiffa, people, some people say, you know, they just want to have that experience or they want to have all of their meat come that way. But when I start telling them about, for example, if you were to do an on-site slaughter at a farm versus put the animals on a truck and go hundreds of miles to somewhere, and all of the other pieces that you would have to factor in in terms of the animal's own welfare, it just makes me think you could have this really beautiful ideal of having a relationship with your meat and being outside the factory farm system, but you could also end up doing a lot of stress and harm to the animals, either doing it on-site slaughter without proper restraints and proper systems for the animal to feel safe, or putting the animal on many, many miles of, of being standing on a truck. And I'm really, I'm really curious about the future of, you know, 21st century farming. It doesn't have to look like it looked 100 years ago because we have a lot of great technology, but there's a lot of steps between being able to have a relationship with your animal and changing the food systems in a way that lots of people will have access and really the animals will will be best taken care of on every step of the way. So yeah. Right. So uh, uh, the, the, real, the real answer is what you already said, Sarah. We're talking about uh, changing our food system in a very deep way. So having one relationship with one animal while the rest of it's going on the way it has been is a kind of boutique eco-spirituality. You know, it's, it's even kind of like an internal eco-tourism. So it is appropriate, it's, it's better than it's better than not doing anything though yeah yeah and so um so anything which increases the the plot the plausibility the possibility and the systems for having right kind of slaughter is a positive development but ultimately we don't want just that we're eating meat and so we're that is raised in a right way and so we are pure that's not enough we need the whole society to be changed we yeah. need laws to be changed and not just this laws but secular laws the whole thing needs to be transformed to be sustainable and compassionate. Yeah. And this applies not just to animals that we eat, it also applies to farms and how do they treat the animals that they're keeping off the farm so that they so that their crops don't get eaten, for example. You know, there's there's many, many, many levels to this. Yeah.
So shall we go forward? Yes, let's go forward. Okay. So I want to, where do we have our Shemitah text? What page is that on? We have it, we have it very soon. Um, let's go to that. Yes. Um, is that D? Or? Well, we have it um, at the end of B, so B3. B3, okay. Oh yeah, of course. No, not B3. I'm talking about Shemitah Leviticus. Oh, oh, here. I have a page yeah, out of order here. Okay, got it. B B3. Oh, there are three things labeled B3 here. All right, beautiful. It's okay. third B3. The third B3, and then after B3 comes B5. Okay. Um, we are. We'll work on our math later. <laughs> okay, but the B text... Uh, Dealing with also with covenants in a different from a different angle. So basically, um, well, let's look at B. Let's look at B from the beginning. Okay, go quick. We're going to go quickly through this. Um, B one we already did. We already did B one. Yeah. B two and B three uh, are about Noah and the animals in the ark. And what's very clear throughout the story of, of Noah, and I'm I'm going to refer people to study these texts. Uh, after the fact, or if you want, go go to neochasid.org and look up, um, or you can also do it on jucology.org, uh, the, the text on um, Genesis and Jubilee, that I have a whole text study uh, sheet that goes into this in detail. And by the way, I'll just say this right now since I can remember, um, if you have trouble finding this and you want help or you have other questions, you can write to me at this email. And I'll be happy to help you or to send you links or other resources. So going to, to uh, through Noah without reading the text, uh, every time that the covenant is mentioned in the story of Noah is a covenant with Noah and the animals. Every single time, or Noah and the earth, or God and the earth. So God's covenant is never with humans alone. This is very important because our, our whole religion is modeled on the idea of covenant. Um, rooted in the idea of covenant or structured by the idea of covenant. And the first covenant in the Torah is not a covenant between God and human beings. It's a covenant between God and all living creatures, between God and the land. So that's B1, B2. B3 uh, and B4, which is still labeled B3, mm -hmm. um, that's his Exodus 23, 12 and Leviticus 25, 4. Um, what we see here is that we our covenant with God, which involves Shemitah and Jubilee, and, and Shemitah, Shemitah year is the seventh year where we rest and don't farm. Jubilee is the 50th year, where the seventh, seventh year, um, plus one, where we uh, where all land transactions are canceled and people go back to the original land that they started with. And of course, at the root is Shabbat, which is every seventh day, when we all rest. But as it says, six days you will do work, in the seventh you will see so that your ox and your donkey may rest and your female servant's child and the stranger be resold by Unifash. So notice here the language. You will rest for the sake of your animals resting and your servants resting. So the, the, the object or uh, the focus of the rest is not actually you. You the owner, you the person in control. It's the animals and the people that you have some measure of control over. The focus is their resting. And you're, you get to rest as part of the process of letting them rest. That's the focus. And then in the seventh year, very important, the seventh year there will be a year of Shabbat for the land, and all the produce of the land will be for you to eat, for you and for your domestic animal and for the wild animal which is in your land, will all of her produce be for food. So um, there's a strong argument, which I have made in a, in a number of articles, and you can, you can look at the, um, this Shemitah uh, um, as the purpose of Sinai is a, an article you can find online that I've written. Um, it's, a, it's easy to argue that the whole purpose of the, the Jewish covenant, the covenant of the Torah, is to create a society capable of observing the sabbatical year. And in the sabbatical year, what's most important is we don't farm the land, so we take a step back from our human control of the space of nature, right? And um, we eat, 
we share all the food that grows, not just with our animals and freely with any person, but also with the wild animals. Now, the rabbis derived a few things from this, one being uh, you had to open up or take down your fences because you couldn't eat anything that the wild animals did not have access to eating. Uh, the second, that you couldn't eat anything in your house that wasn't growing in the field because you couldn't eat something in your house that wild animals could not eat outside of your house. And so this is breaking down the separation between human space and wild space putting us back into a kind of a, a grown-up Garden of Eden situation. Um, so this is, this is actually uh, the key reason why we know that this is the height of the covenant, because in fact it does return us to that state of the Garden of Eden, where everyone was sharing the same food in a commonality, right? In a, in a common system uh, where there wasn't a hierarchy. That's in a way the way it's supposed to be, but we can only do it once every seven years, right? And so once every seven years, we get to taste Eden in that way. I'll just add one quick thing. And uh, again, contact either of us if you want uh, more information on this. But the obligation to share food equally, the idea to have a storehouse in the city where you would gather all of your extra food and then give it back out to every person in the town, that historically, as a Jewish concept, comes from this law that David's referencing right now in terms of Shemitah. So the idea that we were originally told, if you have extra food, you can't just store it up, you have to share it with the animals, then became this bigger law that actually is something that we still do today, which is we have extra food, we share it with people who are hungry, people who are less fortunate. So just another neat way that laws about caring for animals can give us other ethical commandments. Mm -hmm. Good. So let's move to section D now, because we're not going to, by the way, in case anyone's confused, we're not going to get to all the text. We have 12 pages of text here. It's a big typeface, but it's still a lot of text. Uh, we're not going to get to all of them, but we're going to get to uh, touch on a lot of pieces of them. So the next section D is about the sanctity of the parent-child relationship, the sanctity of the animal-parent-child relationship. Now, one thing you need to notice here, first of all, is that the animals that we're allowed to eat, mostly, uh, and I'll explain what that mostly means in a second. We're talking about mammals and birds that all have close relationships with their young. And so, in fact, we have Torah laws about the sanctity of those relationships. So the, the, the fundamental one, actually, which is um, often think, thought of as, as a ritual that doesn't even make sense, but it makes perfect sense in this context, is don't cook a kid goat in its mother's milk. Right, that's we're, at, we're at D1, D1 right now. We're at D1. Uh, but you, it's, only, it's only clear that that's not just a ritual, but a, a deep insight into what uh, motherhood or parenthood means when you put it in the context of other laws. So the next two laws uh, are more explicitly about this, right? An ox or a sheep or a goat, when it's born, it will be seven days under its mother meaning nursing for seven days. And from the eighth day and on, it may be accepted for sacrifice of fire to Adonai. And an ox or a sheep, um, it and its child you may not slaughter on one day, in one day. So this is, um, first of all, this is a very uh, direct instruction about agricultural practice, which we don't follow. That is, even on the, um, uh, the someone in Kibbutz Latan will please correct me if I get this wrong, but from what I know, even on Kibbutz Latan, which, is, which has a, a, a deep commitment to ecological issues, Animals uh, that give birth, calves, are not left with their mothers for seven whole days before they're taken away. And this is, um, this is something that should change in all of Jewish practice everywhere. That, we, that is, if an animal isn't raised in that right way, then it shouldn't be uh, acceptable for us to use it for food either. So that, would, that in itself would have a tremendous impact on factory farming. Now D3, though, deals with wild animals, particularly birds. When a bird's nest is met before you in the way, and the strangeness of that English reflects the strangeness of the Hebrew, uh, the chick or the eggs, and the mother's crouching over these chicks or eggs, you will not take the mother on top of the children. You must send away the mother and the children you may take in order that it will go well for you and you will lengthen days. So both of these are talking about the, the mother-child relationship or the father, also the father-child relationship, because of course this applies to fathers and mothers in most species, in many species, not in all, but in, in many of the species, certainly with birds, it often applies. Um, this was interpreted widely as having to do 
with these relationships. And I'm going to read Maimonides, who is the quintessential rationalist philosopher, but not rationalist in the modern sense, because he affirmed, as any sane thinking person would, that animals have feelings just like people have feelings. Because we can see this, but now we can measure it. We couldn't measure it uh, until fairly recently through magnetic resonance imaging of animals' brains and human brains. Uh, but I'll, I'll go back to that in a second. I want to read Maimonides first. It's forbidden to slaughter an animal at its young on the same day. He's referring to D2. This being a precautionary measure to avoid slaughtering the young animal in front of its mother, for in these cases, animals feel very great pain, there being no difference regarding this pain between human beings and the other animals. The love and the tenderness of a mother for a child is not dependent on reason, but upon the imagination, which is found in most animals, just as it is found in human beings. Now there's a debate about whether Maimonides is right or not, whether that's the correct interpretation. Uh, maybe these laws are just, uh, according to some people, tests to see if we'll follow strange rules to show that we're properly obedient to God. Or maybe we're supposed to do these things not because we are worried about the animal suffering, but because um, we don't want to act cruel because then we might be cruel to human beings. Those interpretations are part of the Jewish tradition. They're late. Um, and they are dependent on a foreign way of thinking which is not rooted in the Torah. Now, foreign ways of thinking are not necessarily wrong. And we take a lot, Judaism is, is known for taking from many different cultures and integrating it into how we read the Torah. But in this particular case, I want to say firmly, um, these laws may have all those other reasons too, but they also have the reason of respecting the sanctity of these relationships. Now, I'm going to read uh, D5, which is one of the people who um, questions Maimonides' interpretation. And I want to show you that even questioning it, he comes up with something that's very strong and important for us in terms of thinking about sustainability and um, compassion. The mitzvah of sending the bird away and also otova et beno, you will not slaughter in one day, these two mitzvot that we just read about, these two commandments, um, both are explained, um, but the reason for both is to not let our heart become cruel so that we should not show mercy. That's what his first explanation. Or that scripture will not permit doing any slaughter that would uproot a species, even though it permits the slaughter of that particular species. Behold, one who kills mother and children in one day or takes them at the same time is like cutting off that species, causing them to become extinct. Now, this is very interesting because, first of all, in Ramban's time, people didn't even know that species could become extinct. They thought that God had providential care over every species, uh, not over every individual animal, but over every species, and so God would not let a species become extinct, and yet he still came up with this interpretation. Now we know that species do become extinct, uh, and more and more and more of this is happening very quickly in our time, something to be very worried about. In the meantime, we have this rule, his interpretation. So he's saying, I'm not sure if Maimonides is correct that it's really about the feelings of the animals. He's not saying the animals don't have feelings. He's saying, I'm not sure if that's the purpose, or at least it's not the, necessarily the primary purpose of the commandment. But what he's saying is that uh, it might have other deep purposes, which are equally important. And this idea that one of them has to do with uh, causing species to become extinct and applying that in a case where clearly if you take an animal and it's young, and you have a whole herd of cows and you happen to take that animal and that animal's baby at the same time in the same day, that's not going to cause that species to become extinct. And yet he had this idea that someone who would act that way is someone who would cause a species to become extinct. And that's true, as we know from the clear evidence of what we're doing in this world. That is, someone who is willing to take mother and young simultaneously, uh, who's willing to essentially to take whatever one wants because simply because one wants it, uh, that is a society that will destroy the earth. That is a society that will cause the other species to become extinct. And that society we're, is the society we're living in now that we need to change. Uh, now, D, that's all of our D text. So let me uh, take a moment, Sarah, and also to know that we're going a few minutes over for but not a lot. So we're going to touch on some of the things that come after this, but we're not going to have time to go into them very far. I uh, just wanted to point out that one of the organizations we work with in 
Establishing Animal Welfare Standards, AWA, Animal Welfare Approved. You can all uh, look, at, look them up online, AWA. They actually do have a standard for weaning. So they encourage the animals to have a full 12 days minimum each baby with its mother if it's a, a nursing animal, if it's if it's eating off of its mother um, in those days. So there are it's it's extremely rare in an industrial system and the majority of meat or dairy that we consume in North America is is from cows whose babies they didn't even get to see their baby. Their baby was, you know, born and then that was it. Uh, so even an AWA approved farm, they actually have uh, certifications for that. So just wanted to throw that in there. And um, yeah. I'm going to be giving some uh, links and suggestions for further involvement with our work and how to educate yourself better on high welfare animal products if you are choosing to source those for your family, for your synagogue, for your community. Great, Sarah. Thank you. So uh, I'm going to summarize a bit of ENF right now, and then I'm going to go to G2, G1 and G2, and that's probably going to bring us to the end of the time that we have, okay? So E, the text under E, um, from Exodus and Deuteronomy, these are all laws about how you treat animals, specifically work animals. So when we have animals that we use for work, um, and one of the interpretations of the Talmud is that in the Garden of Eden, what it meant to have dominion is that we could use the animals for work, but not to eat. And so there's this idea that kind of that kind of a partnership relationship might have existed from the very beginning. That idea is in the Talmud. Uh, but there are specific rules, all of which indicate that the animal has a kind of has rights, essentially, what we would call rights. Now, the word rights doesn't fit the Torah because uh, that doesn't fit people either. The idea of rights is a modern idea. But what rights mean in the Torah language is that everyone has an obligation to do a certain thing towards that being, towards that animal or towards that person. That's the Torah's equivalent for what we call rights. So animals clearly, from that perspective, have rights, not the same as uh, human rights, but certain rights that they have. Obviously, um, the story of Noah makes a distinction between animals and people because you can eat animals and, of course, you can't kill people, right? And yet, there are all these laws that tell us about how we treat animals. Again, this is part of a covenantal relationship. It's a part of a relationship in which animals have rights. And I want to add a, a perspective, as we mentioned in the beginning, where animals have souls that need respect. Now, F is entirely midrashic, uh, almost entirely midrashic, and it's about uh, ideas that animals um, have souls or have personhood or subjecthood, which re merits respect, or um, have moral agency. So I'm going to let people look at those on their own. And again, if you want to, if you want to um, ask me questions or learn these in some other context, here's my email, and you can feel free to write to me. Now go to G, G1, G2. So G1, of course, perhaps the most important line in the Torah from an ecological perspective. Elohim saw everything that God had made, that the one had made. Behine tov ma'od, but here it's very good. And by the way, uh, if you make Kiddush on Friday night, you can add this verse to the beginning of your Kiddush. And uh, we like to get everyone to yell together, Fihine tov me'od, tov me'od together. It's very good. That is, the whole of creation is much more important and valuable and deeply significant than any one part of creation, including human beings. So let's look at Maimonides' interpretation of this, which is so rich and so important for what we're talking about. He's, he's saying here, nothing is created for our sake. Everything is created for its own sake. Humans are not given the creation to do what we want with. That's not its purpose. We are not the end of creation, its purpose. We are a part and a very important part of creation, but we're not its purpose, its goal, and uh, its masters. So here's what he says. All other beings have been intended for their own sakes and not for the sake of humanity. If you consider the Torah, the notion that we have in view will become manifest. For with reference to none of the things created is the statement made in any way that it exists for the sake of some other things. God only says that God brought every part of the world into existence and that it conformed to its purpose. This is the meaning of the saying, and Elohim saw that it was good, Vayar Elohim Kitov. That is, for all creations, all the stages of creation in the Torah, it says that it's good, which means, for Maimonides, it conformed to its purpose, it existed for its own sake, not for our sake. 
And about the whole, it says, Elohim saw everything that God had made, and behold, it's very good. So the whole for Maimonides, that's the ultimate purpose. He understands the whole of the universe to be a living, single individual with a soul, with a heart. We have the privilege of being a conscious part of that great being. Um, we are in the image of that kind of greatness, that kind of personhood, each one of us individually. That's our specialness, is not that we are more important than everything else around us, but that we reflect the importance of the whole of creation. And now, let's see, Sarah, do you want to end with a particular one? You can read the, the Ramak Moshe Cordovero, we already read something from Moshe Cordovero, who is stunning with respect to animals, but he talks about how every creature is honored by God, and that if we want to be God-like, if we want to be in the image of God, we are required to respect and show ultimate honor to every single species, to every single individual that we can see. We should not despise, we should not be disgusted by, we should not denigrate anything that we see that's a species in the world, but rather respect that God uh, created it and that God loves it and cares for it. So last, I think I'm going to end with, with uh, the very last text, Baal Shem Tov. Perfect. What makes you superior to a worm? Hmm? All of you, the worm serves the creator with all its mind and strength. Bear in mind that you, the worm, and all the other small creatures are like chaverim in the world. We're all like friends. In other words, equals, dependent on each other for our relationships and our sustenance and our um, well-being, our joy, our love. For all were created and have the ability have only have the ability given to them by the blessed creator. Always keep this matter in mind. Um, it's an instruction about humility for, huma for human beings. It's also an instruction about comradeship with the other creatures around us, which of course includes human beings, right? And so we should look at other people and see everyone as friends, but we should also look at every other being, the animals, the trees, right? Even the mosquitoes as somehow on some level, friends and comrades. Totally. Whether we, we appreciate them because they pollinate blueberries and we love blueberries, or we appreciate them for a reason we can't know, but that they are also God's creation. It's a hard one. We didn't say this was easy. <laughs> yeah. uh, thank you so much, David. I'm really happy to end on that text about worms because I think that if we can have compassion for all beings, even whether we're talking about a majestic eagle or a kind, sweet, adorable baby goat, or if we're actually talking about something like a worm or a chicken, which might not be the type of animal that people are excited about caring for, we can have compassion for all of them, and that can actually be our action, that can be our spiritual practice, then that can bring us to really just a new relationship with animals, with the earth, with each other, with God, and it's very, very inspiring. I hope everyone out there watching is just as inspired as I am today. Uh, we're going to conclude with a couple notes of ways that you can get involved, ways you can stay connected to David and his work with Neil Hasid and also JIFA, Jewish Initiative for Animals. And I'm going to start by everyone going to the last page of our, of our handout that we're all on. And if you can go to the very, very last page, just scroll all the way to the last page, you'll see that Jewish Initiative for Animals logo pops up again. And first of all, um, we have a little activity for you. So if you're in a small group of people and you have 20 to 30 minutes, you can do this activity to learn more about Jewish animal ethics. What's happening in the 21st century that we actually need to go food product by food product, chicken raised for meat, chicken raised for eggs, cattle raised for beef, beef, cattle raised for dairy, fish. What's happening in each of those industries that we need to take a closer look and understand how those animals are suffering and how, whether we still eat animal products, whether our neighbors and our family, our synagogues, our schools are still eating animal products, we're not gonna tell any one person necessarily to cut out an entire category of food. We're just gonna help them say, look, if you have these values, if you care about animals, we wanna help you source the highest welfare products 
available. So you can download that Jewish animal ethics section and you can, it was a developed for the Hazon food audit and toolkit. You can learn about each of those categories of food, what the issues are and what the alternatives are, how to find a high welfare animal product in the 21st century. You can also go to our website, jewishinitiativeforanimals.org, for resources and regular updates about our work to end animal suffering. Two things I want to highlight that you can find on that website is our ARC project curriculum. So if you're in a community where there are students ages 10 to 13 who are studying to become bar bat mitzvah and they want to do some volunteering with animals, we have this amazing workbook that helps to turn that volunteering into service learning. And there's all kinds of, we have, I think, 15 different lessons on what Judaism says about our relationship with animals, some great resources there that we developed and that David also advised us on developing. Then there's also resource pages on wildlife, farm animals, and companion animals. And we hope that you'll visit that website and that you will, uh, that you will learn. And I want to just give an extra shout out to my companion animal. This is Sodi. Hey. He slept through most of this talk, but he says hi. And this is my, I'm going to turn it over to David to just say a couple more words about getting involved with Neil Hassan. Thank you, Thank Sarah. You, Sarah. Um, um, Jiffa's Jiffa's just doing great work, y'all. So I hope you'll support, support them. them. Um, you, Neil Hassan has a list, and you can find out about when we add new material, when I add new material to the site, which includes songs, prayers. A lot of the prayers are focused on either feminism or ecology or both. Um, this book is my book, Kabbalah and Ecology. It's coming out in paperback. You can pre-order it now from Amazon. So I recommend you do it because that will encourage the publisher to actually do their job, which is always a challenge. And what I'd like to do, what I'd like to do for the end is to go to, C, to B5, text B5, and sing it. It's a beautiful song, and this song, there's a beautiful video from Israel uh, with, Shimsh with Shimshai, uh, who wrote it, actually. Uh, a little, little video at, this, at the bottom of the page that you can listen to this song. So you, if you want to learn it, go to that. In the meantime, uh, I'm going to sing it through once, so we can just enjoy the sweetness of this. And this is about our covenant with the animals that's going to happen in the future. So again, Hoshea 220, uh, text B5. Becharati lahem, rit bayom hahu, im hayat hasade, bim of hashamayim, veremes hadama, the keshet vicherev, umilchama eshpor, min haaretz, behish kavtim laveta. May we live to see uh, these covenantal relationships living in our lives and in the lives of all of humanity. Amen. Thank Amen. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Global Day, for giving this opportunity. We hope to hear from many of you over email. And have a wonderful day, everyone.